So good morning. I hope you enjoyed coffee. So um, I'm Sebastian Seba. This is Bart. We're going to talk about OpenSum. So for you who don't know OpenSum, it's really like introducing application security activities as part of a software development lifecycle. Right? Microsoft calls this SDL. Uh, we call this SAM, Software Assurance Maturity Model. Now, the project already exists from, for quite some time. We're going to explain a little bit how it works. This talk is really about uh, what Bart and I have gathered as experience, like what worked and what did not work, and we're going to try to like, share that experience with you. Okay? So, Bart, maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, myself, I'm this, uh, okay, you can understand this, right? Okay, uh, so I'm a, an, uh, a security consultant working at the moment for PwC. I'm uh, mainly working in application security. I've been uh, working for, on the topic about uh, yeah, more than 15 years. Uh, I'm mainly involved in uh, secur uh, security assessments. Um, as well as SDLC projects, so applying these kind of models uh, for our clients and helping them to improve their security practices in their, in their company. I'm uh, involved in the Belgium chapter as well of OWASP and in some other organizations here and there. Okay, Bart. Um, so I'm Seba, uh, or Sebastian. I've uh, become involved in OWASP when I went, came to the first uh, conference actually here in Royal Holloway in 2005, and then started the Belgian chapter shortly after that. Got quite heavily involved in a lot of uh, activities in OWASP, but now really focus on uh, making sure the OpenSAM project gets pushed forward and uh, making sure that the Belgian chapter uh, succeeds and, and stays very active. Um, in my spare time and to, get to, and to pay the bills, I work for a company called Torion in Belgium, where I do application security consulting. So what we're going to cover here is um, very shortly, because I probably assume that you know why we would want to do something like this. Why are we integrating application security as part of an SDLC? We are also going to explain what OpenSAM is about. Mm, we're not going to spend too much time about that because we really want to share the lessons learned uh, with you. What we're also going to uh, share with you is uh, activities and plans on the OpenSAM project itself. So first of all, why would we really care about application security when building software? Somebody's going to pen test or maybe hack our application anyhow and find the vulnerabilities, that's for sure. So that's indeed what we're seeing. So what we're seeing is that the most of our software is in production, but it has come into production through a couple of phases. So we typically have design phase, somebody thinks of new, like new functionality for an existing application or like a completely green field. Somebody actually will build or code the software internally, externally, or we're like downloading components, putting it all together. Hopefully this all gets tested and it's going to be pushed out in production and software is probably going to be built like in iterations. It can be agile, can be waterfall. So what we see currently is that in terms of application security activities, Really what we see is I like pen testing activities bef just before it goes into production. Uh, that's always the case, like we're like pushing out this software tomorrow, can you test this, see if there's anything wrong. Or we find vulnerabilities through vulnerability scanning or through incidents in production. We try to put in in front like WAFs to, to protect our software and hopefully maybe we're like getting better at testing our software well during an actual testing phase but looking for security problems. Now this is a very, I would say, reactive way of doing application security. Because the problems have been introduced in earlier phases, because what we're trying to fight here are design flaws, which are introduced in design phase regarding security, and security bugs. Now these all have, introduced, have been introduced here. So we want to go from a reactive mode to a more proactive mode. We want to build in security activities as part of the building. So I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's something that we need to make sure our developers and the people in IT that we're dealing with understand. So this really means that we have to introduce like security requirements and threat modeling as part of design activities. We need to introduce secure coding guidelines and provide these to our developers and not only like provide them these guidelines, but also explain them how that works, provide them training, make them understand how that works. And believe me, that is really necessary. 
I was like only like last week, I was in front of like 20 developers and I did a quick poll. I asked them, do you know what SQL injection is? About half of them knew that. I asked them about cross-site scripting. None of them had any idea what it was. Uh, and they're actually building and pushing out code. So this is necessary to do this. Now, you don't do this overnight. And this, like introducing these security activities is not something you're going to like do in, in one day or a couple of weeks or a couple of months even. So we need a structured way to introduce this. So hence we need to introduce what we call a secure development lifecycle and that's where SAM comes into the picture. So what we really need to do is we need to build like a maturity model right? because like building in these application security activities is like a hard thing to do and there's a number of reasons for that. So we need to change the way people are working and as you know people are really resistant to change. So you cannot do this like a big bang approach unless there was really like an incident and like a very, very hard push uh, top down to change things. You're going to meet resistance. So we need like an iterative way to introduce these kind of changes in, in how we develop and build code and deploy code. What we also see is there is no single recipe and there is no silver bullet here. There's no, no, nowhere there will be a silver bullet for secure software. But what we need to, to have is a solution that we can tune towards our organization that we can also like adapt to the risk level of the different applications that we're building and deploying. What we also need to make sure in our secure development lifecycle solution is that it's, it's clear for the people who are involved that it really describes pretty well what people are supposed to do. And because this is quite a huge and complex problem. So it has to provide a lot of details for non-security people. And we know uh, from experience and from you being here in this kind of conference how this works. But if you explain this to IT managers, operations people, developers, it's, it's quite a hard problem. And overall, and that's the most important thing, it has to be measurable. We have to make sure that we can start measuring these application security activities and that's where SAM really is well at. It's a maturity model. It allows us to measure application security activities. And by measuring, you can manage that. And that's what SAM really is about. So Bart's going to explain you more. Yep. Um, sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK. First of all, um, there's quite a bit of companies that are using SAM in practice already today as we speak. Uh, we've been involved in some projects here and there. Uh, there's quite a bit of companies that really don't want to share uh, whether, what they are doing uh, in, in terms of software security practices. So there's definitely many more than these companies listed here. Uh, let, let's do a quick poll. Who has been using, uh, who is familiar with OpenSAM and who has been using it in, uh, in the organization itself? Okay, there's like four, five, six, seven people. So you'll see um, the, the model itself, it's, it's been used quite a bit. And actually, um, we're, we're setting up uh, a system to, to, to monitor and to, uh, to, to measure uh, what companies are being, used, are being using these kind of models to improve their practices. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the model in itself is, is structured. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's important that you understand the basics, the fundamentals of it. So SAM, in, in, is, as a model, is structured in a, in a hierarchical way. At the highest level, you have these business functions, and these are kind of activities or concerns that a company should take into account when developing or when using software in, in a company. Uh, they, you will see these functions are typically um, things that an, a company has to do anyway when, when using this software. And as such, uh, these, these functions are well aligned, typically well aligned into how a company operates or is structured in organizational teams and things. So for instance, construction is about developing software, while verification is about making sure that the quality of the software is appropriate. So the construction function is typically linked to development teams in organization, while the verification function is typically linked to QA people in an organization. So in that sense, this is actually the link of the open SAM model towards the organization. Under these business functions, you have the security practices. And this is really where the security specific uh, activities come into play. 
And these things are defined as, as activities that, um, as, as, things that, as things that companies have to implement in order to improve their software security uh, in, into the organization. And so you see that for every function, there's three security practices being defined here. Um, very important, so the link between the functions uh, and the practices is actually how you can uh, apply uh, security activities into an organization because the functions, they represent how the company is structured, while the practices, they are actually the, the, the core structure for the activities, the, the software security activities themselves. Now, every practice in itself has a number of concrete activities that can be, that can be implemented in an organization. And let's take uh, an example here. Uh, for instance, the security practice education and guidance. Uh, it has a number of activities um, that, that can be implemented. And actually, every security practice is organized into uh, different maturity levels. And this is really where the maturity model comes into play. So you have uh, different maturity levels increasing every time. So at the most basic level, there's a number of activities that you can do. In this case, for this example, for education and guidance, you could, for instance, make sure that there's generic awareness training to developers. So that's such that uh, developers are aware what security is, what problems they might face, things like that in software. And at the same time, uh, they, um, you can build technical guidelines, like coding guidelines and these kind of things uh, for developers to make sure that they uh, use the proper practices when uh, developing software. At the, at the next level, you can see, for instance, that the training that was uh, implemented in or uh, provided in the first level becomes role specific. So you start uh, distinguishing between different roles in the organization, like developers, architects, program managers, or project managers, and you start giving role-specific training. So in that sense, it's a more advanced activity uh, compared to the basic activities. And this is the way in which all these uh, security practices are set up. So you have different activities, and they are ordered uh, in terms of maturity levels. OK. Um, this, not, this is not where it stops. Um, actually, OpenSum per uh, security practice and per level defines a number of things. So we've seen objectives and activities, what you want to achieve and what activities you can implement. But also it uh, specifies, for instance, what results do you, want ex uh, do you expect to come out of these activities. If you have uh, technical guidelines, you expect coding, gu coding standards to come out of this kind of activity. So OpenSum specifies concretely what results you can expect. It specifies also, for instance, metrics. How can you measure that an activity is correctly running inside of an organization? It specifies costs. How much will it cost in terms of money, in terms of personnel, how many mandates, things like that. And very important as well, it also specifies what other activities are linked to this. If you're giving uh, training on coding, you first have to make sure that you have uh, some coding guidelines available. If you're doing code review, typically you want to do that based on coding guidelines. So you first have to specify these coding guidelines, and based on that, you can do code review. Uh, you will see later in this talk that the things that OpenSum uh, specifies here are is really important in order to implement an OpenSum or software assurance model into the organization. And we'll come back uh, to that later. OK, back to Seba. So when, when you first download and you, and you read through the document, which I obviously highly recommend, um, it's, it requires quite like, it, it, it's a steep learning curve. Uh, it's, it's, it's a deep delve directly into all these activities and um, very well designed, so very accessible, that's, that's for sure. Uh, Pravir, who created the document, uh, did, a, did a good job of that. Um, but what it lacks and what we're going to improve in the next version is we're going to start like, or to add like a quick start. So how do you really start with, with applying like some on, uh, on your software development life cycle. So what the quick start is really about is it's based out of four steps that you iterate. So first of all, you need to assess where you are right now. Yes. So there's questionnaires in some that will help you, that will guide you to do that. So that you can assess what current level are you for the 12 security practices throughout your organization or your business unit or your development team that you're assessing it on. So once you know where you are, the next step is, okay, what's our goal? Where do we need to be? So that is our 2B situation. Now, how do you define that? We don't simply invent or like have like a wish list. Okay, I want to be like some level three for education and guidance. 
This will heavily depend on what kind of software you're going to create or you're developing or you're de deploying, yes? Or what kind of risk level your organization is at. So, but what this will bring you is like really the gap. And I'm pretty sure that here your goal will be quite higher than where you are. Otherwise, you would not be doing this, yes? So once you have that, you have that gap between the as is and the to be, this really brings you the possibility to start or plan to get from where you are to where you want to be. And that is in some what we call building a roadmap. And some is very good for that because it really defines, like you saw in education and guidance, the activities to reach those maturity levels. So and these are the building blocks to build that roadmap. Yes. Now, that's the plan. We're still working like on paper between brackets. The next step and the most important step is implementing this. And this is where OpenSum will not help you. Uh, this is really where the rest of OWASP resources will help you. And uh, that this is where the actual work has to be done. So and doing this and kickstarting this process is really like the like how you start and start improving your software development lifecycle in terms of security. Okay? So First, like, how do you do this assessment? Like I said, there's questionnaires available within the SUM guides. There's also like Excel spreadsheets you can download from the SUM website to do this. I'll even point you to an online resource to do this. And it's not hard. So this assessment, what it does is it really goes through a couple of questions for each of the security practices. And like here, we've taken, for example, the same like education and guidance related assessment where you have here the question, so have most developers been given high level security awareness training? If they have, this is a yes. If they have not, it's a no. It's quite simple, yes. Is there, does the project team, do they have secure development best practice and guidance available? You can ask them. If they don't, it's a no. If they have, it's a yes. Now, if you have two yeses here, you're actually already at level one, unlocked level one. So, and this is how you really like start measuring by doing this assessment, and this is like, you can do this in a couple of hours, depending if you have the, the people available to, for, like, to calculate the level on each of these security practices. And you cannot have like a level two if you lack level one activities. And so that's the way normally the maturity level is being calculated, okay? So it seems simple. But when you start doing this in, an, like in a big organization, it can be quite like a, a challenge. And that's really where we want to share our lessons learned here. So on an organization-wide, before really you start to assess like software security maturity, it's always a good thing to first look at the overall maturity level of the actual software development activity. Because if they are not organized and if they're like, person A does whatever he wants to do and team B like downloads all kinds of modules and pushes it out and, and like whatever way they want and they're not working in a mature way or not in a, like an organized way, from time to time we feel like we are bringing in activities that are more mature than their like proper software development processes. So. It's very hard if the software process is not like well organized before to also bring in like maturity increasing activities from a security standpoint. So that is something you have to check up front. Pre-screen pre -screen like the software development activities themselves. Now, back to some activity measurements. The first thing you will notice is then if you're going to do this on like, a, like your own organization and it's quite big and you start filling in these questions, is like for, for different teams and for different technology stacks, you're going to have different answers. So it's really hard to like, so what's my SAM level there? So what's really important here when you're doing this scoping and building roadmaps is to set your scope from the beginning. What am I going to focus on? So, and here there's several options. So, am I going to deploy this organization-wide and like measure this, start measuring this organization-wide? Then you will see that a couple of the activities or the security practices that you're measuring make sense on an organization level. 
but some will not make like sense on an organization level. So if you're working on like construction and coding guidelines, well, the, 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 the C development or the .NET developments will have different maturity levels and different guidance than, for instance, a Java team. Or you might have several operations groups that are working on several stacks of software. So you'll have different sum levels there. So you have to tune or scope your assessment towards the, the division or the group you're working with. Yes? That's really important. Otherwise, your assessment will not make sense. Is that clear? So this is both true for development. What we see a lot is that we have a lot of organizations that are not developing internally anymore, so that you have to do like the assessment on their suppliers. And they have several suppliers, so you have several assessments. Where in terms of deployment, you might have internal hosting, or external hosting, cloud hosting, so you will have several assessment activities there. Really important here, what we've learned is make sure you involve the key stakeholders of the software development lifecycle. Don't only go to the developer, but go to the, the manager of the developers, to the IT manager, to the head of operations, so that they know that they understand what you're doing. If you don't get their involvement, you're going to fail. Yes. And this is really also the point where you can like pitch them what you're doing. Make sure that they're understanding why you're doing it. So, from another couple of points, like lessons learned, doing assessments is how to organize these interviews or assessment sessions themselves. And how to score, really. So, you cannot like, or it's, unless it's a really small organization, you will not find it possible to do like the complete questionnaire with one person. Because it covers really a lot of activities, like from governance, construction verification, till deployment. So we'll probably have to involve people from risk management, from development, from QA, for like and operations. And what you need to do is you need to tune the questions, the set of questions, obviously, to the people that are in front of you. It's quite straightforward, but that's not really explained in some, so you have to implement this yourself. What you also have is what you cannot do is simply send them the question list and say, well, fill this in and send that back to me. They're probably not going to understand it or just fill in yes or no everywhere. So you have to just, like, explain this to them. And what we've seen is like doing this in interview mode or in workshop mode really works best. Explain them the context, explain them the questions and what's behind them. Also really important is that you explain to them that you're not like auditing them. It's like what you need to do is like we need to understand and help you together with you what your current level is to improve this and once they get that they will be much open much more open in providing you with real answers so then when you've captured the several like assessments you will quickly see that it's really hard to like reach higher levels of maturity because uh, like Level zero activities most of the times also require some kind of formalization and it's for a lot of organizations quite difficult to do this. Yes. So sometimes what we see is like instead of like giving them like zeros all over the, the place is like providing some with some adjusted scoring because they do some level two or some level three activities. What also helps from time to time instead of asking a simple plain yes no is okay but how much people really, how much people of the, your development organization have received awareness training. Uh, for instance, if it's 75%, it will be much more meaningful than simply a no, because not everybody has received it. Yes. Sometimes also, it's really useful to, when you have these questions, and if they're doing a certain activity, is to also go further and see, okay, what's the maturity level of your, like, coding review activities themselves? And because, and then you can like capture the, the CMM level of the activity itself. And also, this is really the, the chance to ask the people themselves what works and what does not work. And it's always very surprising that when they start thinking about this, they really know what's wrong. 
And capturing this and capturing like quick wins for later on is really crucial in this step. And then once you've captured all these assessments, you will aggregate the results. Sometimes it will be quite difficult because you have different results from different people in the same team even. And that will really depend on how much pressure they were on when you asked them the questions, for instance. It's surprising to see how different questions are when you ask these questions when their manager is in the room or without the manager. Yeah? Or if you ask it to the manager, he says, yes, 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 we, we, all, we do this. And then you ask the same question to the people who actually do the job. And of course not. <laughs> yeah. So you have to like do some reality checking there when you're really doing the validating the results. So repeating the question to several people and like adjusting that to what you think is real. And also what we've explained here is more like the lightweight approach. It's like asking and based on their answers, it's yes or no. You can also go deeper and ask for evidence. This is more like a full, full approach. Also, it helps from time to time to say, okay, we're going to anonymously gather your responses and aggregate them. So this all helps in making sure you're having a good as this assessment. Okay, then the next step uh, of the four steps is uh, defining the, the goal, the to-be model. Where do you want to go as an organization? And this is really where, where you have to define for the organization yeah, what are the important practices that I want to do, where, where, what do I want to achieve as an organization? This is actually where you want to go from an ad hoc approach in an organization where some people are doing some things, other people are doing other things, but it's not very well aligned into a more structured way of dealing with software, software security. And actually here, Sam is very helpful in structuring this because some, some Open Sam provides you with a structure in order to define where you want to go. Now, the, the, the time frame of this to be model, where you want to go, it can vary, but typically you have to think about, you have to think of in terms of like three to five years. Where as an organization do I want to stand in like three to five years with regarding to, to software security. Now, in OpenSAM, you have these scorecards shown here that uh, the colors don't, don't really uh, show very well. But what, what these scorecards typically represent is you have for every security practice, you have an as is state and you have a to be state. And you, you represent that for every, for every security practice. So for every security practice, you're going to, you have done the assessment in the previous step. So you know all the as is states. And here in the goal, you're going to define all the to be states. And these scorecards help you in representing this, this to be state. It can be helpful for a number of things. You can do, use these scorecards in a number of, different uh, number of different steps throughout the implementation, throughout the improvement phase for an organization. The first one is to do actually gap analysis. It's very straightforward. You have the as is, you have the to be, and you define what's the gap that I should cover in order to reach the to be. That's very straightforward. Uh, so you typically do that um, before doing implementation steps. Now, you can also do it after the implementation step. If you have implemented some activities, some improvements, you want to convince measurement, uh, measure, management sorry, that you improve the situation. So in this case, you can again use these scorecards to demonstrate, okay, this is where we were before we did the improvements, and now we actually achieved this. So this is the, actually the improvements that we did. So in this case, again, the scorecards are very useful in representing what you have achieved. Also, sometimes these scorecards are used in the long term. So once you have achieved improvements, it's important to consistently keep those improvements because it doesn't make sense to improve something now and then uh, do not pay attention or invest anymore into continuing this. And in the long run, it might disappear again. So again, uh, you can use these scorecards in, in, in an ongoing way so in, in a repeated time frame, uh, from time to time, assess again where are we and are we sure that we are on target for the to be state where we want to be. Okay, now setting the goal, setting the to be situation, it's not an easy target. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, what we have learned um, in doing this, first of all, is that it's very important to link it to the organizational context. Uh, so for instance, is there a business case for doing this? 
Uh, from time to time, business cases have already been defined, but often we come into organizations where they, where they ask us, from, uh, I want to improve my situation, but actually we don't have an idea how to, how to sell this, how to, what's the value that, we, that it's bringing to us, and how can we defend this to, to higher management. So a business case, defining a business case in this, in this uh, is, is really important. And a business case is typically linking to drivers or arguments like, okay, an organization needs to be compliant with some kind of regulation or an organization wants to improve its efficiency in, 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 with respect to secure, secure development. Or um, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, protect your reputation as an organization. In, you know, when you would have vulnerabilities in your organization or incidents, uh, do, do damage protection with regard to reputation. Now, of course, a business case, it's always important to, um, to prove return on investment in a business case. And I, I don't know if you have ever tried to to calculate uh, the cost of security in organization, but you will, you will know that it's really difficult to do. Eh? To, to calculate risk and security or in added value of security in organization is, is very challenging. Now, there are some resources in doing that. There are some statistics and some, um, um, there have been written some papers that, that really show the, the, imp the added value or the improvements that you can, that you can do, um, that you can have by implementing these kind of models. Um, there's a number of papers by, by Microsoft, uh, Sigital has written a number of papers about that. So you have some resources that can help you in defining the business case in that, in that sense. Uh, one other thing, another thing to take into account is to uh, look into the objectives of the organization. What does the object, uh, obje organization want to achieve with implementing this business model, with this, this assurance, uh, assurance model? Is it just the fact that they just want to be compliant with some regulation because otherwise they might lose their license. In a financial institution, for instance, it's very often the case that they want to do exactly this. They have license that they want to keep and they have to prove that they are in line with these licenses, uh, with, these, with these regulations. So you, as, as, an, as, an, uh, as an, an objective in that sense, you have to take that into account in defining it to be. Uh, other organizations might be, actually we don't really care about software security as long as we don't have public incidents, that's okay for us. It can be a perfect, a perfect, uh, perfect objective for an organization. And you have to take that into account in defining it to be. And of course also the risk appetite of an organization uh, is really important in this. You, you will know that the risk appetite of organizations varies uh, greatly. Some organizations actually they, they don't really care while others uh, they have very small, uh, very small risk appetite. Okay, so if you take that into account, all the context, it then boils down to um, defining what activities you want to implement in this to be model. Uh, what we often see is that uh, of, uh, organizations or people are overshooting where they want to go. So you see, you see these cases where actually want to achieve the top notch of almost every security practice. Hmm, that's a bit strange because the implementation effort that it requires to implement all these, especially the level three activities, is quite big. And that means if you have such an enormous budget that you want to achieve all these level threes, you're probably the NSA. Because I don't see a lot of other companies that, that have really benefit in implementing all the level three activities of all the, of all these, of all the security practices. A good, a good guidance in this is the, the, the average security level in, in at the average sector level. So if you're a financial institution, have a look at what other financial institutions are doing in that respect. And try to, try to tailor a bit the, the, the to be model according to the, the average uh, sector level in that sense. Uh, also, the dependencies between practices must be taken into account here. Again, as I said before, the example of the, the, review the, the coding guidelines, if you want to do code review, you need coding guidelines. That means that if you want to reach a level two for code review, you will definitely have to have a particular level of education and guidance. Otherwise, you won't have those coding guidelines. So there are dependencies in there, dependencies in there, and you have to take them into account. And finally, it, can may, it, it, it may seem that you always have to improve your level, but that's not really the case. There might be cases in which is the case that you have reached a particular uh, uh, maturity level as an ASIS, but in the long term, for the company, it, it's not that important to, to maintain that level. So it might, may, it might be useful to actually lower a particular level and actually spend more effort on other practices in, your, in, the, in the maturity model. So it's not always necessary to improve every security practice that you might have. 15 minutes, okay.
Okay. Uh, very important, um, and it's linked to the business case as well, of course you have to get uh, consensus from the management. If you define a to be, and the upper management is not, uh, is not uh, fully aligned with this, it will be very difficult to implement this, because it will take uh, quite a bit of effort from the organization. Take the example of Microsoft with their trustworthy computing nodes. It's a perfect example of a, of a, situa of a company where it worked well, because they had full support from the upper management level in the, in the, in the, in the company. Um, typically, we're going to, when you're going to defend this to, to upper management, the first question that you will have is budget. How much is it going to cost? Again, uh, for, uh, for, for calculating this, it's not, it's not that easy to do. In the open SAM model, there are some guidance, and there, are some, there is some information in there regarding budget. How much mandates is it going to cost on average for the different stakeholders? Now, if you see that in reality, it's not always very, very um, realistic, the, 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 the estimations that are in there. So you have to really make sure, try to calculate how much it will cost. Again, there are some general statistics that you can use there. For instance, um, if you're building in a, a security competence center, the average is more or less that you have one person in the competence center per 100 developers, for instance. And it gives you an indication of how many efforts you will have to, or how many personnel you will have to uh, uh, put into those, into those security competence center. Okay, and then for big organizations linked to the scope that you have set, for big organizations, it might make sense to create templates for this uh, and spread those templates to the different scopes that you have defined in the organization. If you have uh, selected uh, scopes per organizational unit, you might create one of these as a to be templates and just may distribute them to these different groups and uh, ask, kindly ask them to implement it or to take that into account. Okay, the next phase is then the planning. So once you have defined where you want to go, now is the time to, to reason how you're going to get there. And this is what the planning is about. So what does planning do actually? You have an Aziz situation where you're starting, you have a to be where you want to go in the long term, and the planning uh, actually defines a number of uh, intermediate phases to get there. It's as simple as that. Um, Open Summit itself includes in the model a number of templates for these plannings, but of course you have to tailor those plannings to your organization. And again, it has to take into account the concrete situation of the organization to, make, to be able to make such, uh, such roadmaps. Um, let's see what, um, what, what we can use there as, uh, as, as, as advice. First of all, it's useful to identify the quick wins in there. Um, if you're doing a long-term assurance program and as, as initial activities, you're going to select activities that will cost a lot of money and are, not, are difficult to, to show the improvement to the organization, it will be very difficult to convince management to continue the exercise. So in that sense, it's really best to focus on the quick wins. What are the activities that don't cost too much in the organization? And where can I directly, Im I immediately improve, uh, improve that it is, is a benefit to your organization? That's what, that's what the quick wins are actually. And so one of these is, for instance, awareness and training. It's a quick win, why? Because it helps to spread the word to, to a lot of people because of awareness, and it, it will um, immediately increase the level of uh, the people involved in security quite a bit. And it's definitely, typically one of those activities that you want to focus on in the beginning of those, of those roadmaps. Um, one other thing to take into account is that um, open the software assurance in itself, it's not an isolated thing. If a company is doing development and releases, you have to, of course, align the open SAM improvements uh, to those releases. So you will have to make sure that the planning aligns with the release cycles of these, of these, uh, of these uh, key applications. That means that if you have release cycles of like every six months, uh, it doesn't make sense to have phases in open SAM like for a year or two years. It's too long. You have to adapt the planning to, to the release cycles of your, of your company because that's what, what's, what's driving this open SAM. Okay, um, it's of course also the, the work in the different, um, in the improvements that you're doing is actually going to have an impact on different uh, roles in, in your organization. It might be, uh, there will be impact for developers, for testers, for QA people, for, for other types of people. And of course, it's also important to spread the work between the different roles and responsibilities almost evenly throughout the organization. If it's the case that in the beginning of the planning uh, in, in the beginning of the roadmap, you're putting all the effort in one group, and at the end of the roadmap, uh, you're putting all the effort to another group, 
it will be very difficult to implement that in practice. So you'll have to spread out over the different groups and over the different roles in your organization. 10 minutes, okay. Take into account dependencies, we've explained that. And for sure, be ready to adapt the planning because you will set up a planning for the coming years and you, you, you can be very sure that after a year you might have to, st uh, to steer the planning to, to, uh, to other things that have happened in the organization. Okay, some tips about budgeting. Um, we've seen in practice that the overall impact, the average impact on, on projects is about five to 15% um, for, for this kind of improvement tra 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 trajectories. 15% it's really like the startup cost. So in the beginning you will spend more money but once we have set up a number of activities in place, the cost will typically lower a bit um, once, once everything is in place. And over, on average, on the long term, uh, um, impact of, uh, budget impact is typically about 5% on, on typical uh, improvement projects. Of course, you have to take into account the cost of tooling and training. Um, it's not only about setting up things, but you have to make sure that people are using them. And also, if you're working with external suppliers, make sure that they're also into the picture, that you know what the impact is on these suppliers as well, because it will have an impact on the contracts that you have with these suppliers. Yeah, and also different technology stacks makes things worse, um, so there will be an impact there. We're going to have to speed up a little bit. Yep. So, so now we have the plan, and now is the next step, and this is implementing. Now, implementing is obviously the hard work, the heavy lifting. Now, there is also, and that's, uh, you've probably seen a lot of other uh, projects and stuff going on at OWASP. What we want to point out here is that there are a lot of OWASP projects that can help you out. Uh, for instance, doing education and guidance, WebGoat, OWASP education projects going to help you there. So there's, I'm not going to explain each project here in detail, but be aware what we're going to do in the next release of all, for like some is to, for each of the activities, give you pointers towards other OWASP projects can, that can, you can use as resource to actually implement these. Yes. So in terms of what we've learned is overall while implementing some is that you really have to adapt some to your own organization. Just don't blindly follow some but see what works within your organization and really like piggyback on that. If your organization is really like test driven, focus on those activities first, for instance. Also what, what's really key here is don't like do this for all your applications at the same time. And that's not going to work. Focus on your high risk applications first. Recheck your progress, derive lessons learned at each iteration, make sure that you're, that you're ready to adapt your, your planning while you're implementing. It's really, it's really important here. Now, since, we're, since some is really about measurements, you have to make sure that while you're setting this up and while you're implementing this, is that you make sure that you're reporting this. So create some reporting dashboard and report this to your management so that later on you can check afterwards which activity really worked, which one didn't work, and cross-verify this with the number of vulnerabilities detected in each phase of the development so that you can make it more efficient. Another really important uh, thing to, uh, to take into account is typically you will have organizations applying some activities on new like initiatives, new projects, that's normal. Now, don't forget about the whole like legacy and like the stuff that works, nobody wants to touch anymore. So make sure that this, this is not forgotten, but for instance also don't like blindly apply, for instance, source code reviews on like your complete legacy code base. That's going to provide you like a lot of surprises and a lot of work. So different, activities will be required for new projects or for legacy projects. Now, not really explained a lot in OpenSAM, uh, but you can really also apply this to any kind of development lifecycle. So also in like an Agile. So we're going to add some guidance in the next release of OpenSAM on how to apply this on Agile processes. It really depends on how you apply the application security practices. Some of them you will do like at every sprint. Some of them you will do for like in each of the sprints that require some kind of security activities. Or you will like have like a one security specific sprint. So you can divide these application security practices uh, in agile processes and steps. Now, 
what you will also, also, also see is when you start implementing some is some is really like a mixture, and that's not really clear from when you first lead it, but it's really a mixture of people-related activities, process improvement pr uh, activities, knowledge building activities, and tool-related activities. So you have to like balance out those dip difficult or like the, those various activities over the different uh, aspects. So what we've also seen is that unless you don't have like unless you have like a driving like competence center behind this is going to be really difficult. So what we see is that like creating like a central group, like injecting this kind of application security expertise, you really need that, but don't become the bottleneck. You have to like start this up and then distribute this knowledge. So market and promote application security and do not become like the auditor or the risk function, that's somebody else's responsibility, help the developers. Sell this to them, that you help them. Do not like become the operational bottleneck, and like for instance doing security testing or source code reviews, you can do this like with an application security competence center, but then you have to learn this to the developers themselves and to the QA people, so that they can also take up some of that work. Make sure that you spread that knowledge, that you identify people in the development groups or in the QA groups as like champions that are really like, that get this, and that become like local satellites of your application security competence center. So, and that way you create like a community within an organization that knows about application security, and you have much more, like much better communication within the organization around application security. So, this is really like, this ends like the, the, the quick start and lessons learned. So we've seen assessments, um, we've seen to be, we've seen planning, we've seen implementation. Now, some more slides about OpenSum itself. We have quite some resources that are available on, uh, uh, from the projects. Obviously, we have presentations like these. We have tools like to do worksheets, like assessment worksheets, templates. We have some translations also in other languages. Now the German translation is nearly done, and we have some draft. We hope to publish that uh, on short notice. And also, SAM is being mapped to other uh, SDLC, like related uh, other um, SDLC uh, activities, like BSIM or PCI, or is also an ISO standard on application security. So, what we've done also, we've done uh, Open SAM training that released like this week. What you also can do is you can start your self-assessment online. There's a, a guy in Australia called Christian Frischot, and he has like published online a self-assessment tool that you can use yourself. So I'll leave this for you to read, uh, to make sure that we have maybe some time for questions. Okay. So uh, like very quickly, if you're, in, like, if you're doing this, make sure that um, to share your knowledge. If you're doing this that, and you see things that work, share it with us. You can get involved, uh, obviously, in the project itself. Um, and so donate what works uh, to our project. Thank you very much. Any questions? Let, let, just to make sure to repeat your question in the mic. So, for sure. yeah. so um, my question is, uh, how are the activities and the practices, uh, how do you come up with it? Is it based on your experience or is it based on something else? And specifically, how do you decide which um, things are level one activities and level two and level threes? I can, I can, I can definitely take it. Um, it's, it's, uh, 
based on, on, on experience for most, but it's also uh, based on a number of things like dependencies. So for instance, if you have level one, two and three activities, it's often the case that for level two activities, they actually rely on what has been done in level one activities. And so the definition of activities is uh, for most based on, on experience and what we see, what we see in practice. Uh, but the, the maturity models behind there, the, the maturity levels in itself behind there is actually the general notion of level one is kind of initial, level two is kind of more advanced, and level three is really mastering. That's the idea behind it. And you also have to work with these dependencies between them. I think those are foremost the driving factors uh, in, the, in the open sum model, I mean. Yeah. As I've got the mic, <laughs> you've mentioned the costs of implementing this, but what does the scheme have a system whereby you can value the benefits of imposing this system into, into a, a Yes, yes. So the question is, uh, is, there, uh, is there like a way to measure the benefits? So in each of the activities, there is also success metrics defined. So it really like defines how you measure success and what it really brings in terms of uh, added value to the software development lifecycle, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.